Yeah, a small introduction, introduction uh, of uh, our speakers today uh, for campus design. Uh, Shaman, I think maybe I can do that. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, I can do that myself. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, disconnect here. Yeah, maybe you can you can introduce yourself and start the uh, session, Sahana. Welcome yeah. to the School of Architecture. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. I see a motley group in um, in the video today. I see about 15, 16 people over here, and I'm guessing that there'll be a little few more people who are uh, online, who join online. So everyone, I'm Sahana, Sahana Raghunath. Uh, as Shaman rightly started, I work um, I work in a part, as a part of uh, the infrastructure team for Infosys Limited. I'm an architect, uh, worked for about 20, close to 20 years in the industry. Uh, for 15 plus years, I was in the consulting in consulting side. And then now for uh, close to five years, I've now moved on to the client side. And uh, so I have a wide spectrum of working on uh, different uh, scale of projects, different types of projects. Thankfully, uh, I have got uh, opportunities to do. And today uh, I would like to uh, talk a little about uh, campus design um, and uh, the various aspects of campus design. Uh, my aim today is to give uh, you all a metrics uh, or some sort of a framework, how to start on a scale like a campus. The campus, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to, uh, um uh, ignore all the other talks right i think we will have i could hear a lot of talk talk back coming from i guess we'll ignore all of that and we will get to the question answer session uh towards uh probably mid halfway uh, during the talk and probably also uh to the end of the talk so i guess you all have had good lunch and i'm hoping not too heavy so that you don't fall asleep during the session i will share my screen and shamant if you can just tell me if I can share the screen and I think they just I don't think I can share the screen because I've it's been disabled. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I think they'll enable it in a minute. Yeah. I think Sunil sir, you're there. Sunil sir? I think I can now. Yeah. So I'll just let this small sketch be in the background while I talk a little bit on what is it that we are going to be expecting in the next uh, couple of hours. Uh, campus design uh, needs a lot of uh, ABCD sort of metrics that one um, can go about a partly because it is uh, uh, it, it is in part uh, because of its scale of a project and uh, the other thing is uh, what the design brief itself says. The design brief that has been shared with you all, uh, and, it, and it has been shared with me also, is that of uh, School of Technology and Architecture. There are multiple blocks. There is a campus. There is an existing campus on site. And uh, all the new uh, blocks designed will have to uh, merge together. And I think it has. there is another very important part of the design brief, which is that the campus design, or rather the campus, uh, is expected to be net zero. Uh, by 2025, which is very lofty, but uh, it, it, it's, it's already we can understand and see what can actually get to it and what uh, uh, can get to nearly being net zero, which is also not a good, not a bad uh, thing overall. Um, this sketch is just basically to say that how overall in the industry, uh, architects work, there are a lot of, there's a whole lot of stuff that uh, the clients come up uh, asking for there's efficiency, there's built up area, there's money, there's so many things, and then there's there's always a whole lot of things uh, that is a part of uh, of of a of a project. And uh, what is important is uh, design works or not work uh, depending on how good a collaboration on that is. Collaboration, when I mean, I mean collaboration between varied. Uh, design professionals, design, I mean, subject matter experts like uh, MEP, HVAC, structural, landscape, so on and so forth, and not just the architect. Uh, it is very, very important to understand that the architect plays a role amongst all of them because uh, a final product, whether be it a design only or uh, uh, something that comes to fruition like 
uh, uh, construction and eventually to operation uh, is very, the collaboration that has happened in the design stage uh, shows forth. And it sort of becomes a metric to see that whether a building or a campus works or doesn't work in the long run. So the much uh, discussed often height point of context. I will also be talking about the context, but how are we going to talk about context in this, in this respect? One of the prime aspects of campus design uh, due to its scale uh, is that it affects, it affects all the various uh, neighboring, uh, the neighborhoods, the people who move around the neighborhoods, the students who decide to come to attend their classes or attend their, do their courses, spend their lives, a good part of their lives uh, in these colleges, all of it uh, gets affected. And hence, uh, it's very important to understand where, the, where a campus, like an educational campus, uh, sits in the overall context. Uh, the other important uh, factor is uh, the, what I will be touching upon a little later is about net zero and context is a very, very important thing to achieve a net zero campus. What is context is something that you all know, you've already come up to the seventh semester, I'm guessing. And, uh, but what is important is your design should align to the idea of what the context that you are setting up. In this situation, you've already been given a design brief where, which is sort of giving you guys a framework and then you will have to design for it. And uh, that is already forming a context. Uh, but what is also important is that an integrated design, an integrated design meaning a design where not just architecture design, but uh, MEP design, mechanical. I mean, I'm talking about HVAC, I'm talking about uh, plumbing, landscape design, uh, road networks, uh, power, electrical, all of this has to come together for a project to uh, be successful uh, and to come to fruition. Uh, that is what I'm talking about in terms of integrated design. Uh, I'm guessing at this stage, we will uh, be only talking about the architecture design. Um, and uh, it, I will be slowly giving you glimpses as to how we need to work with other consultants and other uh, aspects of uh, construction industry, which is very important to take this forward. Sorry. Yeah. There are three different aspects that I'm talking, uh, that I wish to uh, say. One would be the campus design metrics. Uh, the other would be the building planning metrics. The campus design metrics by themselves are uh, of course, to achieve a net zero campus together, we need to talk about how we do, how we design the campus level. And we also need to uh, look at how we design at the building level. Of course, we need to go much deeper in, um, uh, in reality to achieve uh, net zero, uh, which I'm sure you will not be doing it at this stage, but that would be, that would mean, you know, um, during construction and then eventually during operation, uh, also things have to work because net zero actually means a campus, if I may speak at the campus level, it is to reduce the percentage of greenhouse uh, gases or GHG emissions is what we call greenhouse gases consumed during the campus right from the construction stage at, up to the end of its life. So it's a, it's a long process. So it's not just about the design phase. It's not just about uh, uh, the construction phase, but it starts from right from the construction phase. Uh, or even getting ready towards construction because many times it is digging, it is uh, uh, demolition uh, of existing structures and so on and so forth. And it'll be removing of certain trees if that's also a part of the whole thing until the, the point of every year uh, operation where the users start using the space. And year on year, this, this uh, 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 there is a documentation that is preferred done wherein uh, energy consumed should be equal to what the energy uh, can be produced at the campus level. Uh, these are very lofty ideas what I'm talking about. In reality, these are extremely difficult to achieve a net zero campus uh, because of which in the industry, I mean, I'm talking about the global industry where there are certain buildings called near net zero, which is fantastic to achieve. And then we also 
set up a date or set up a sort of a future uh, uh, hope that you know by 2023, 2025 or by 2050, sorry, 2050, we would achieve net zero of the campus. Uh, anyway, so coming back to the metrics that I'm going to be touching about, I do believe that it's very important um, at the master planning level, at the site level, it's important to identify, meaning look at the brief, talk about, I mean, discuss about what is important to uh, actually house and what is important to not house. Uh, let me explain a little bit. It is important to decide as to what is what are the functions that you would like to enclose in a brief form and what are the functions that you need not enclose in a brief form. Uh, uh, and what are the and 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 uh, at this stage it is important to also realize that what are the uh, activities that you would like to or prefer to enclose them, but then if you can't, then it's still okay. Like for example, uh, a cafeteria or a food court. Uh, a food court is uh, great if you can um, enclose it, and since this is also in Hyderabad, it will be great if there is air conditioning. But if you do not, uh, for whatever reasons, for design or for other reasons like energy conserv conservation. Uh, if you do not, it still can work. So these are good things to identify first as to what are the different aspects of the brief that we have. Then sort of locate it in the overall design. I know these are very basics what I'm talking about, but I will just illustrate these to you a little later. One of the main things that comes into the picture about uh, achieving, about going on the way to achieving net zero campus is orientation. Orientation of blocks is absolutely important because uh, uh, of multiple reasons. One of the things is we are in the tropics and uh, uh, we all know what it is uh, in, in terms of, you know, heat gain and, uh, and also achieving good light daylight throughout the, you know, throughout the day. It's, uh, also important to understand that in a tropical country like ours, one of the best things is actually being in shade. If you can be in shade outdoors, it's fantastic. If there will be breeze, there is your shading yourself from uh, the harsh uh, sunlight, uh, sorry, the harsh uh, heat. Uh, but if you're inside a building that is also shading while it allows uh, good breeze to get in, I mean, that's a plus, of course. It also allows uh, glare free light to get in. Well, that's again a plus. But all of these things can be achieved by a simple metric of orienting a building. The next thing is, of course, connecting. We're talking about various blocks here in a large campus, so we connect. And the, the point of connect is here, it's not just about the building to building connect, but it's also the connect of different people. Like if a student comes into the campus, so where, do, where does he start from? He gets in through the entries to one of the entries, entry blocks or a security building, or uh, it can be anything, or it can just be a gate. Um, it can be anything that, that, a, that a student comes in and how does he or she uh, follow a path to get into various blocks? Uh, does he prefer to, uh, does, uh, does the student prefer to have a, uh, you know, have a quick bite and a drink and then get to the classes or do they want to just you know, hurry up and get to the classes quickly? Um, is, a, is, a, is a campus going to be pedestrian friendly? Is it going to be uh, just pedestrian friendly or is it going to be strictly pedestrian? Uh, these are the various things that that emphasizes um, how great an experience is for uh, the final users. And now the users are, of course, the students. The users are visitors. The users are for uh, the housekeeping staff who come in every day and clean. The users are for, um, what can I say, industry experts who probably be coming in for placements and for other things for someone like me come in and give you a talk. So what is my experience of something of, of a campus? Uh, also for people or at the business level, if I may see, look at them, it would be for people who would be funding. Look, how great does this look? I mean, there's good enough to be funded, there's a bad, I mean, so on and so forth. So connect uh, various aspects, entry exits, uh, the synergies between two, two, two blocks, three blocks, there for different activities. Uh, all these at the at the campus level or at the master planning level is important. Next is of course the area. Now that when I talk about the area, I mean uh, figuring out as to how much area that every block 
or building block or every built environment will need. This would, of course, mean a lot of number crunching, figuring things out, saying, okay, is this enough? Is not enough? a bit of a um, guesswork at this stage for all of you guys. Uh, there might be some metrics like saying that, okay, I would, one student might need an X amount of space for their desk, for somebody to sit, for somebody, for uh, enough space for the chair to go behind. I know I'm getting into the nitty gritties, but then these are what metrics are. And an area of a build form is always, it always comes down to metrics of usability, metrics of buildability. Buildability means uh, there are certain metrics of how a large structure uh, or say how a G plus one structure, G plus two structure, G plus 10 structures uh, can be column free. Uh, as architects, we love areas to be column free, but then our friends in say in the civil uh, department will definitely come up and say, no, no, that's not possible. You know, we need to have columns. Well, that's true. We need to have columns. And there is a certain metric in, uh, in structure design as well, which talks about there's a certain area that uh, there's a certain length that can be cantilevered. There are certain uh, depths that can go uh, uh, with column free, certain angles, you know, whatever the, the design um, asks for. Um, the, the last but one, does, one part is the facade design. <clears throat> and it's very interesting as to why I have put the facade design as a metric in the campus design um, <clears throat> planning metrics, because the facade design very, very closely linked to the orientation. And I will touch upon a few more details on the facade design. And it's extremely important about the facade design being slightly thought about at the master planning stage in, in your overall design. Uh, it would show whether we want to have a building which is longer, shorter, taller. Uh, you know, uh, do we want a rectangular shape building? Do we want different shapes of buildings? Do we want a circular? building and circular plan, I mean, circular building, do we want a curved facade? All these things are very, very important to decide and to discuss. Uh, uh, when I say discuss, I'm, I'm guessing this would be a teamwork. If not, then discuss with your, you know, uh, lecturers, uh, peers and peers to come up with something that makes sense when it is kept or located or oriented at the campus level or at the master line. One of the, one of the most important thing, the next thing is about optimizing design. This is something that we always forget. We come up with the design and then we're very, very, very happy about it. The first or the second uh, time that we are reworking or working about it, we're very happy about it. We forget it. We say, that's about it. This is the great design. This is the best design that I can come up with, like say the weekend or in a, in a, in a semester, uh, in a uh, two, three uh, days of work or I don't know, some nightless weeks. But what is important is optimizing design is, is the most important part to achieve anything that is worthwhile or achieving anything that comes to fruition at the later level. Taking time to stop, to reflect, and to see how well we can optimize is one of the, uh, is, is one of the, I may say so, greatest gifts that one can give ourselves during design. And believe me, this optimization or the intent to optimize any design, especially if it's yours, is, uh, is a great skill to to uh, to equip yourself once you get onto the industry. You might not have much time in the industry as much as you have uh, now while you're designing in your semesters. But optimizing is 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 something that you can keep uh, learning. You have to keep learning while in the industry, and you can just keep getting better and better. The metrics for building sorry the metrics for for building design. Uh, is this visible on the side or should I move something? Shamant or somebody, can you tell me if the building it's metrics? Visible, it's, it's visible. It's visible. It's visible. It's visible? Okay, great. So on the right, I have something called the building planning metrics, which is I do start again with an efficient facade design for every for a building because an, uh, uh, a facade uh, uh, sort of makes or breaks a building, uh, not just because how how a building looks, uh, how it sits within the entire campus, especially in a you know campus that you're talking about, where there are certain old buildings, and how does your new buildings, new set of buildings sit? Does it gel? Doesn't it gel? Um, uh, so on and so forth. But also very important are all these other things of uh, metrics which uh, affects the facade design and affects the idea of whether you can achieve net zero or not at the campus level. So. 
uh, I spoke about the master plan and the landscape design. When I talk about, and when I mentioned here, saying that sustainable site design, it is actually means that how we plan our master plan, uh, how we plan the master planning level uh, includes whether on includes decisions on landscaping, whether we need to have certain plants, whether we need to have certain trees, uh, what amount of trees where, uh, how is the water plan, what are the levels that we will have, and where is the water going to go from one point to another. Uh, very, very important um, aspects of landscape and master planning design achieves, and this is also a very important metric to achieve net zero campus. We are talking about at the building level, of course, we have very important aspects of indoor environmental quality, meaning inside the building, how every user looks at, feels, and um, how is it that he experiences the environment that, that's there inside the building, which is about daylight, is it glare free? Uh, am I feeling, uh, so does the user feel good about being there in summer, winter, uh, rainy season, is it humid, is it not? Uh, does he have to, he or she have to close their windows uh, because it's just too much glare or it's just too much heat? Uh, or is does the building allow a user to open windows, feel the breeze, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, feel good about it? I mean, sometimes the breeze can also be very warm and whether you want to have it or not. Um, and about the air quality, which is what I talked about. Uh, the facade is a big thing. How much of it can, how much of the facade is open enough that I can look outside? Can I look at various aspects of, this, of the campus or is it that is it that I'm just going to look at one aspect? Is it, is, is it going to be a very linear kind of a design? Uh, is it a very designed approach? Is it a very deliberate approach where I need to see or look at certain aspects of the campus? Or is it like, is it going to give me a wide um, view altogether? And uh, of course, it's acoustics. The type of the facade that you have will definitely uh, uh, show if you can cut off the the din and the noise from the outside uh, to the noise to what is happening inside. Like you could be having a campus fest um, where Merin, you know, there, there could be a uh, 200 students doing something outside. While can the rest of the students still continue working, or can we access, uh, you know, libraries where we can work uh, with focus uh, or study with focus? Does college or the campus allow us such luxuries and such privileges to uh, uh, to the users. I mean, that's important. And the facades um, make or break this particular point. Uh, the materials and what we choose to have in, in the building, um, right from all the plants and uh, everything that we have at the campus level, right from the compound, if I may say so, uh, everything talks about and everything shows about what sort of, uh, or, rather, or rather, what level of net zero can we really achieve? Uh, how much of resource are we using? Are we using something which is uh, commonly found in the area? Is it within 150 kilometers from the site? Is it within 300 kilometers from the site? Or is it something that we're using which needs to come in from, say, be because we are in India, it could come in from, like, you know, the, 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 uh, the northern part uh, of the country or the southern part of the country. Uh, how far is it and does it make sense to really do it or do we have an alternate uh, uh, in our local setup? And, uh, is that going to make more sense? Uh, the next part, of, of course, is uh, when we talk about energy efficiency of a building, the, there are three main aspects of it, which would be uh, lighting, electrical, uh, and whether a building is air-conditioned or not. Uh, as I understand the, the design brief for what is given to you all, it could be a mix. Um, and as at the design level, you need to decide whether certain areas need to be air conditioned and uh, certain areas not. Like for example, the lecture halls, can it be air conditioned? Uh, why does it need to be air conditioned? It's a question you need to ask, can we do it without air conditioning? Or can we do it without conventional air conditioning? There are various ways of cooling um, a space, it's not just about putting, um, you know, uh, single uh, units, or it's not just about doing certain, you know, very common uh, window AC units, but there are multiple ways of cooling. So why not explore that and see if that makes a big difference? One of the major points of 
achieving net zero in at the campus level or building level is about reducing this energy that we are using, uh, that the building uses. Uh, and uh, invariably so in the industry, the HVAC or the air conditioning systems are the most energy intense. And because, energy, because they need energy, meaning they need electricity to run, um, to do whether you have heat pumps, whether you have VRF systems, whatever you use, whether you have chillers, all of these need electricity. So that comes, that brings us to the next point as to electricity for a building to run. I mean, any sort of an, or any sort of a building. Uh, and uh, the next uh, important part is uh, lighting, because much of, of course, I do understand that a campus and an educational campus is a day lit building, meaning you would have morning hours only where students will be uh, will be you know occupying uh, these spaces. But would you have hostels? And it's 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 obvious that people in hostels will be you know working late night, and then lights are going to be all night. Uh, it's very important also at the campus level to understand whether which part of the campus is going to be lit all night, which campus is not going to be lit all night. Uh, because overall, when you do do a documentation of the amount of energy that lighting consumes, can a small part of that be offset by renewable energies? Like solar, can we have a solar farm or can we have certain megawatts of electricity that will come in from solar panels on the rooftops? Or uh, do we have the luxury of having vast amounts of space where solar panels can come in? All these decisions form metrics for campus design. The important, uh, these two, the, this one, what I'm talking about in terms of energy efficiency, the next one, what I'm talking about in terms of water. Quality of water, portable, non-portable. Uh, there is something, uh, a term in the industry called water balance. Water balance is, uh, figure out what is your uh, how much water will will a campus require to run versus how much water are we really looking at harvesting by rain? Uh, do we have bore wells where we can take water from? Very very importantly, how much water can we uh, uh, recycle by our air conditioning systems and by our plumbing fixtures? Uh, this this is a water balance chart. Of course, I do not expect you all to work on it, but then be aware that there are subject matter experts like plumbing um, and MEP engineers who would do this balancing act. It's very, very important to understand that this is one of the main metrics that can uh, uh, that can help in achieving a net zero campus. What can we do as so now? In architecture design, there is a lot of active and passive aspect of uh, design, which helps in, again, being a metric to achieving net zero or not also. One of the main things that I believe is important for any design, but then one particularly for a campus design is to understand the design brief. It's absolutely important to understand the design brief, what it is that the client wants us to do. Uh, Yes, we know each one of you have a, has a flair of creativity and you to bring across, you know, those curves, those brilliant forms into fruition. But does it relate to the design brief? Does it relate to what the client really wants to build? Uh, and I, I will continue calling uh, as from the client side because that's sort of a healthy uh, relationship that you can build that you can foster for later in your industry, many months when you get into the industry. Uh, the next part of which I've already touched apart is land identification feasibility. Feasibility is about, you know, the top thing of saying that, okay, will this block fit in well here? Will, it, will an entrance make sense on this side? Will an exit make sense on that side? Should we have um, uh, um, an architecture block here? Should we have a, uh, uh, an structural engineering block here? Do we have something else? Should we have a food court on this side, so on and so forth. Identification, is this the zoning that we want to have here? That's very important. Uh, the most important thing, again, I've already touched upon it, locate entries, exits, activity zoning, and then orientation of blocks. Of course, and then part, do it all, come up with a basic idea, do all your sketches, it can, and then take a day or two, and then come back to it and reconcile what the requirement matrix is. 
is this making sense? Is this making sense wherein can I put an X amount of students over here? Is it all right to have like say a hundred plus students walking in at the same time just because the classes got over and is there enough space from one building to the cafeteria? Is this going to make sense? You know, all these kind of things, it's always good to reconcile. Uh, and this is a part of optimization of design, what I was talking about previously. So we have on the left, we have these various aspects of, uh, of course, one of the main things and one of the main as, uh, parts of the design is all the different blocks for the SOT. You have, uh, as per your design brief for technology and architecture, the different types of SOTs, uh, so the, the different type of blocks that you want to have and uh, <clears throat> Uh, what are the activities that you want to have inside there? So, ancillary to this will be always the food courts, your games area, things, spaces, and of course, very, very important, the hostels. Also, very important part of is the STPs, the scrap yards, the yards, the transformers. All of these also make, make, make a big difference in where you place them in the campus. Okay, moving on. There are three very important aspects of a campus design, uh, performance, reliability, and optimization. And these are also very, very important to reach our fruition of a building that is great uh, for usage and for a very long period of time. We already have a lot of standards in the industry. One of the very important standard is the ECBC or the Energy Conservation Building Code, which is Surprise, surprise, what the HVAC engineers or the mechanical engineers actually study about. Um, the, in the architecture uh, design, they are not that given importance, but you will see that there's so much um, uh, uh, so much of stuff there, which is very important in how we go about design. So uh, the, the basic uh, point of, of, of building design is always connected to the to the project life cycle, meaning right from finish of, uh, or sorry, right from start of construction, that is end of design, start of construction to its operation as well. It's very important to look, to look beyond the design stage because the design stage is, as I said, a part of the overall life cycle of a building or a campus. There are, these are the various aspects of it, the conceptual design stage, the detailed design stage, the analysis. This is where optimization comes in. The documentation that is making GFC is making, uh, sorry, good for construction, meant to be built at site. Then we have fabrication and actual building. The building goes on to its, uh, it eventually gets into operational maintenance, comes to a point of renovation or demolition. Now, this entire life cycle of a building has to make sense and, the and the energy that will be consumed during this entire life cycle has to be minimum. That is the basic idea and the basic achieving net zero. Can we do it during the life? And how do we do it? And how do we ensure that it is done? By every year in annually checking whether the energy being consumed during this operation right from its construction stage is equal to the energy that we are generating on site or off site. Now, I will now stop talking about the other aspects of design, but then I will now start talking about the building or the architectural design. These are these are all, uh, as I said, this is, I mean, you'll have to do it. There is absolutely no way out. Um, no, otherwise the building is not going to get constructed in. There are four basic aspects of a building. The building envelope uh, or the facade as what, what I mentioned previously. Then we have the com comfort systems and control that's what the ECBC talks about, which would be natural ventilation or we have systems uh, for comfort, which would be air conditioning or you know uh, other ways of cooling a certain uh, a building or a certain area in a building. Uh, you are getting into a world which is getting warmer day by day. So cooling a shaded or cooling or shading a built environment is inevitable. Um, it is inevitable that you understand that a building can 
be uh, a great can give a good to a user but while not really uh, you know being a very expert or not by using uh, you know materials which are uh, degrading environment else the other aspect is lighting and control meaning we're talking about how much light gets into the building because it's very important than the basic building blocks basic blocks of need uh, of any human being would be daylight uh, would be whether he, uh, the, the person feels hot or cold in a space place where they're working study living uh, uh, is there enough light uh, is the light comfortable to work uh, the other aspect is of course electrical power need electricity to for anything to learn even for a, a remote session like right now we need electricity for it to learn so all of these things and then how can we uh, introduce renewable energy to actually offset all these aspects of energy requirements so this is only a basic of the ecbc this is very freely available available on the internet you can just i mean there's there's there are uh, documents which are uh, which are not really like you know fat building code books but they are all the PPTs and presentations where one can understand, any one of you can just read through it and understand it, and put it to use in your design. So, the different aspects, now coming into the metrics of the buildings and the orientation, the, uh, the, the, uh, the size or the scale of the building that we are talking about and the position or the location in at site level. This is again a part of the ECBC and the and the building. Uh, I'm just talking, showing you over here, and I will also show you an example as to how it is done at the practical level later on. So one of the main things about being in the tropics is that we have fantastic light coming in from the north and south, uh, where heat is going to be much lesser south will still have quite a bit of heat but then in the large scenario i'm talking about i'm not talking about in particular areas of north and here this that yeah, Hyderabad, bangalore so on and so forth but at the large level we brilliant light coming in from north uh great light coming in from um, south we need to harness it uh one of the best ways to do is that our buildings can have maximum amount of fenestrations or openings that can be on the north and the south which for activities which need a lot of light, which need a lot of daylight, so that we can reduce the uh, the uh, what can I dependence on artificial light. Also, how to be? We're going to be having multiple buildings. So, which of the building is going to be tall, short, fat, wide, so on and so forth? Uh, and the building is not going to feel bad if you call it fat or lean, because the building can be either a fat building or a lean building. Uh, different angles with respect to the north or the south as to where it can keep come. Spaces in between corridors, courtyards, so on and so forth. Keeping in mind as to how wind moves on. Yeah, these are all basics. I'm sure all of you know about it. I'm going to move on. Next aspect about the facade ventilation. There are certain ventilation strategies, meaning if you which uh, will be of an X height and an X and why width, how much of it is going to make sense for fresh, uh, uh, for fresh air to come in if you keep them keep the windows open? So there are certain ratios of depth to height. If it is a single-sided building, meaning if it is a single-sided opening building, do we have single-sided two or three multiple openings? Do we have a uh, single-sided uh, uh, but uh, a very long building? Uh, the height is very short. So there are various ratios, ceiling to height ratio, which would be uh, depth of floor to ceiling height ratio. Either is it going to be a one is to five, a two is to five, or a five, uh, five is to zero. So all of these has goods and uh, positives and negatives, but it's important and interesting to see so that these are certain metrics that will that are bound to make a space uh, work in mostly all uh, kind of scenarios. Next is, of course, the, the when we talk about the facade, it's about the daylight or, or rather the views that we that we need to get. There are different percentages of how you can open a facade in, 30%, 50%, 70%, and so on and so forth. These are all in the code. What's important, of course, what I've written over here is about we the, the code definitely says that we need to have a window wall ratio or a wall window ratio, meaning how much of a window, with, how much of a opening in a wall 
uh, should be whether it should be 30, 50, 70, 90 or complete opening like like a uh, complete opening, 100% opening is not uh, 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 is not something that we want in a tropical country like ours. We do not also want to see so much out there. Glass buildings also have view panels and spangled panels, meaning certain areas where it is open to see, certain areas which is not open to see, even though it is glass completely. Um, so uh, the code begs it say that there should be a minimum, um, a minimum to 35% to about 45% is what we, we have seen that works. But uh, all of these, what I'm talking about is not just about the code. There are also simulations nowadays in parametric architecture, what we can actually get to know what are the uh, actual aspects and actual metrics that we need to do twice. So coming to uh, design scenario, this is a site in the NCR region. Uh, this is for, uh, 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 for uh, what can I say, uh, 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 business, uh, business camp. These are all workplaces and areas, uh, buildings where people are going to be sitting and working to 10 hours a day, different aspects. When I talk about uh, capacity, basically capacity means they are uh, seating capacities, meaning about say 6,000 people in one building, 7,000 each in these two buildings. And how are we going to manage uh, uh, campus design for it? Sorry. So this is not as you should uh, be expecting now. The longer as the longer length of the blocks are towards the north and the south. Now there are multiple very basic ideas saying that yeah, now we have three. Uh, this is the capacity that eventually the site needs to hold. So that means that X by Y, this is the area that we need. How do we come up with the capacity? Well, the International Building Code has particular area per person that is specified. I would urge all of you please to please go and look at the NBC to figure out for an educational building, what would be the capacity uh, that might So based on that, we have an X amount of three blocks, for example, over here. Now we break it down, go to this, where we break it down to more thinner buildings with a connecting uh, block or a connecting uh, mass. At the next stage, we stagger it. We say that, okay, let's look at staggering because views, you know, also heat and daylight, optimizing daylight, which I will touch upon a little later. Eventually we have uh, the last part where we also need to give them other aspects, which would be the food courts. So there are people, people will be working in one of, in any one of these, come down, have lunch, have a break, have a, have a drink or have a, a bite and then go back to work. Basics, right? Move on. This is what comes out, one of the options from all the basic massing that we are talking about. So we're talking about these kind of uh, ground plus 10 buildings with, so with, with a capacity of 7,000 to 6,500 uh, seats. We have an arrival plaza here, it's built up. We just have a basic form of what we want to build. Next, this responds to the connect aspect of the metric mentioned previously. Where is our entry and exit to the entire campus? This is my north. I have two, these are all the roads that are there. This would be a main uh, entry, entry road. This would also be and is there a median cut? Probably there is a median cut over here. So it would make sense that this be one of my entries, this be the second entry. Uh, it is always expected and also designed for two entries and exits in any of the campuses, uh, large campus. Uh, a, one is of course to handle the large traffic movement. The other is to, uh, 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 is the aspect of safety. Meaning, if this gets blocked, this gets blocked due to there's a riot happening. Uh, there is a big uh, holdup, you know, traffic holdup because there's a massive collision somewhere over here. The other for exit should be there so that people can actually move out or move in to the campus. Next would be how people get in. 
whether they get dropped off, whether they can park their cars, whether they can park their bikes, walk up to the buildings, which one of these buildings are they going to enter? And where are the main entry points of all these blocks? Okay, this is all great. This is all about zoning. This is about, uh, uh, you know, basic orientation, which is about having the longer access uh, faces of the buildings to the north or the south. Very simple, works brilliant. And this is what comes out in terms of a construction ready document. It's the same bill, it's the same. Uh, this has come out after optimizing, optimizing design, and also about how adding in a lot of services, meaning we now think of adding in electrical requirements. So we need to have PGs. What do we do for uh, parking? bring in a multi-level parking block over here. Uh, concisely designed as these are. Uh, it makes sense that you put in a lot of services where the parking block is. Some services can go in like some chillers, so on and so forth. That is possible. Fire tanks, all that is possible to be I know, uh, kept in the in the same building where parking, where the vehicle parking is envisaged. Some are not, and some needs to be very close to the buildings. Coming back to the entries exit, this is an entry, so there needs to be a security building. Uh, this is a second exit, so there are two security buildings. People walk in through. Now, the buildings that you saw in the previous stage, which was two buildings, um, which were connected with a common uh, mass is now come up to these kind of thin, long, tall buildings for not connect, not really. I mean, um, they are centered. We have two large, and these are each building is about ground plus 17 and ground plus 20 each buildings. These are courts catering to each one of these uh, uh, employees that we have. We have all the uh, services and it's all tucked away over here. There is a biogas over here. There is a uh, there's a organic waste converter. All the smelly stuff and STP is very very important things tucked away over here so that it's easy for vehicles to uh, easy for vehicles to get in service. So these are about these are how actual campus designs are made with respect to when when buildings are uh, looked at uh, with respect to orientation, with respect to uh, circulation, and with respect to how we can optimize the de design, uh, balance out external and internal spaces. Moving on, one of the main things of metrics that I did mention previously was about the facade. Why is the facade so important? Because the facade talks about daylight, how much glare it is bringing in, how much glare can we cut out, how much heat is it bringing in? Can we have glass? Can we have some other kind of uh, masonry walls, openings, windows, punch windows, wall-to-wall um, -wall glazing? Uh, all of this affects the side. The decisions as to whether the air, air, can it just have a small, uh, you know, can it just have a whole series of fans that will take care of it? Or can it, or does it need to for, uh, uh, you know, an X, like should it be designed for 24 degrees inside so that it's comfortable in the heat outside? Or can we just do it so that uh, if it is 29 degrees outside or if it is, sorry, I'm talking about Hyderabad, right? So if it is about 38 to 39 degrees outside, Will it be 36 or 35 degrees inside? And is that good enough for uh, for achieving comfort? Uh, so HVAC design is, or the indoor air quality um, and the indoor environment quality is all less designing for comfort. So whether we need to use any kind of uh, uh, air conditioning or a cooling system to achieve it, or can we just have openable windows that can let in fresh air and is that good enough to bring down the heat? Um, very important aspect is, uh, do we want it to be open? And 
what treatment is done to the facade? What kind of uh, uh, material that we choose? Do we choose brick? Do we choose cement blocks? Do we choose uh, cladding materials? Do we choose aluminum panels? Do we choose glass? Uh, all of these I, makes a big difference in how the indoor environment quality is. Very important to this are how we achieve certain uh, metrics that, has, that will push our design or our campus towards becoming net zero. So building in our panel parameters are absolutely important. These are all the small um, metric that is there over here. The climatic, with climatic conditions, we can do analysis with respect, with, I mean, using many, many multiple softwares right now. We don't need to just, you know, use a photometric chart or a certain kind of a chart to, to achieve it. We have multiple uh, uh, parametric softwares right now, which can actually give us, actually tell us that if you do A, B, C, D, you will achieve. So that's, that's and th these are called energy modeling softwares and uh, these uh, they map uh, artificial lighting controls or natural light controls the kind of material that you use the kind of uh, design that you will uh, provide whether your facade is uh, optimistic or is it um, not so optimistic and it is uh, quite plain whatever it is it will give you great these are all the different that is there uh, to achieve a green building or to achieve net zero Probably plain in detail if any one of you wants to get in touch with me at a later stage, or if any one of uh, faculty can tell me that, you know, come back and then talk about this, we'll move on. One of the case studies that I want to present right now is a building. Now we move on to the building. This building is in Nagpur, and uh, it's got a very basic shape. It's like shaped as an X. And the consultant, uh, did it because it was they wanted to angle the building to 21 degrees north now i will explain to you later on as to why 21 degrees north i mean why is it so important it's great it's it is uh, some um uh, extremely interesting uh, simulation networks sim simulation information reports that we have later on which brought us to this angle of 21 degrees north so there's a software that does all of this we build up we uh, the software obviously doesn't do all of this. We have to fill in all the information, bring a build up a model in Revit uh, or in any other of these soft, uh, uh, softwares that is required. About how the building uh, works in in summer, how the building works in winter, and how the building uh, needs to be the building skin needs to be to make all of this work. This is a part of the uh, overall skin that we are talking about. It has, and this is how the building uh, design eventually came up. This is an actual building. It is there in Nagpur. Uh, it has now even started uh, um, operations. Uh, we have these fins as what we call, which has been introduced like over here, if you see fins that has been introduced to shade the facade. Why is shading required? Shading is required to ensure that A, glare-free light comes in, that's very important. B, orientation the facade is in. If you shade it, the heat gain is reduced dram uh, I mean, dramatically. And so shading is absolutely important. Shading is a very interesting um, metric, uh, a very interesting part of design, you will see my case studies a little later on. In this building too, it was, uh, we had uh, fins as what we call, large fins about 4.5 meters uh, tall. Uh, the width was about uh, 450 to 750, depending on which, uh, which side it was. And also angled in different uh, degrees, depending on the direction it was. Here, the building actually has different sides to it i mean the light coming in and light and heat coming in from different sides and the fins were of different angles even what it did was it brought a very interesting shade uh, light and shade inside the building for people to work 
And of course, they also saw a lot of colorful uh, fins through which they could see beyond the building and into the views. We also had something called horizontal shading. There are two aspects. I urge you all to look into your climatic design books. There are two basic shading devices as what we call the horizontal shading device or uh, what largely is known in the industry as the chajas, you know, the, the, uh, the sun shades. Very, very important things in, tropic, in the tropics when it cuts down a lot of unwanted glare and a lot of unwanted heat into the building, whether it is a uh, whether it is a conventional vernacular design or it is um, a very contemporary modern uh, design. These are very basics that if you can take care, the building will be great for the users for a very long period of, of, of time to come. What is also important is we brought in some as daylight sh shelves, which helps in bringing in uh, the good light and it bounces off the ceiling and ensures that much part of the slab or much part of the building uh, gets natural daylight, glare-free, and throughout its working hours. So this is how it came up and the architect had a whole palette of colors. It was beautiful, it looks great. It's iconic in its own design. What's important is the true, uh, it is not, the, the, these buildings are not uh, aligned to true north or true south, but the eastern and the western sides were these large swaths of concrete walls, which is very important to ensure that no heat uh, or uh, the harsh light comes in through these two sides. But we put in all the, our, you know, the services like staircases, very, very important things, uh, electrical rooms, air conditioning uh, units, uh, and storerooms, of course, towards the east and west of the building with a lot of sense. Next, I will be touching upon how we come up with these shading requirements that are uh, there geographically. Now, what works in Nagpur will not probably work in Hyderabad. What works in Hyderabad would not work in Bangalore and so on and so forth. So you, it needs specific and only when you get into the uh, nitty gritties of and the context, that is the geographical context, will uh, will your design reach uh, uh, the point of you know reducing the energy consumed inside the building? So this is uh, for indoor. This is for building in indoor, where we when we did a parametric analysis throughout for all the four sites, the north, not four sites actually for all the eight sites, north, north, northeast. Uh, east, southeast, southwest, west, northwest. Uh, so all eight sites. If you if a building faces any of these eight sites, what is the amount of horizontal uh, shading that we that is required? That is there shown over here in red. These are all sections, if I may say so. And what are the uh, horizontal shading and what are the vertical shading that is required? We did a whole lot of parametric analysis for this throughout the uh, throughout the year through uh, uh, through about 10 years uh, in the past and then just future of 10 years to see that if there is a one degree or two shift in the uh, um, in the temperatures how is the building and how is the campus going to uh, you know work will it and will the campus work in deluges? Will it not work? These are all very important metrics for a campus to work for being future ready. Another interesting parametric analysis that we did was the depth of a floor plate, meaning the depth of a building. Should it be eight meters? Should it be 10 meters? Should it be 24 meters? How do we come up with this? It was interesting because we came up with various depths of floor plates and we, these are the depths of floor plates. These are in meters. And these are, uh, uh, sorry, percentage of daylight versus the how much of lux that, a, that we need or is it possible to achieve, which is aimed at 100 lux. And whether that is possible to achieve in what kind of a flow plate of a uh, building. So various data came in and then we did notice that it starts becoming less efficient being to 10 meter range. Up to 10 meters, it's great. 
with one side windows. So another 10 meters for another side. So 20 meters is something that is fantastic to work. And it's not just me, it's not just this report, but it's also the code that which we say, which says that. This is another part of it. I know boring numbers and boring figures, but one of the main things was about if you put two buildings close to one another, how close should it be so that the daylight compromise and also that you don't, it doesn't start getting too hot or too cold inside. And do these two buildings of the same height, do they shade each other? Do they so on and so forth? This is a height to spacing ratio. And this is the uh, angles that the building takes with respect to the north. And what we noticed was that if the building uh, is in the ratio of three to one or a four is to one, it works good. There's the percentages of daylight that we can achieve. Next, this is a part of the case study that we did. We took a building of an X uh, uh, design of an X and Y uh, size, and we put it in different, different, different in in all eight uh, orientations and saw what works great in indoor. This is particularly largely works for pretty much of the hot and dry uh, climate. So what, what works, and this is where we found, so absolute north, zero degrees, north, complete north, complete south, we get a lot of light and, uh, yeah, and we cut off the east and west, and we take very less light from east and west, works great. 22.5 uh, degrees was the next one, which works fantastic. All other area, all others were not so good. Then, they, of course, the next one was 147 degrees, which was something on the same lines of 22 on the other side, which was fantastic. These are the best uh, orientations which give us where the shading that you need to give, that is the horizontal shading and the vertical shading is much lesser. And uh, you can work with a lot of materials. You can work with uh, stone, you can work with uh, uh, brick uh, or the, any of the other materials that I mentioned previously, which is glass, which is aluminum, I mean, whatever it is. So the optimum, um, and of course, we also have blocks for which it definitely made sense that much part of the building, if it is absolutely not south or 22 degrees not south, it's fantastic. Next was about the spacing between two blocks, how much of heat gain, heat on one building uh, affects the other. This is something that's related to the, what we previously showed. Next case study that I would like to touch upon is uh, I'm sure. Some of you might have seen this building either uh, on site or off site, seen it on the. This is the IMB Bangalore, IM Bangalore, Engineering Institute of Management Bangalore, some parts of the building only, which mind space the newer parts of the campus, which mind space the company uh, has designed. So there was an existing campus, and many great uh, architects have already designed the campus, and uh, mind space came in. Uh, much later, and it brought in certain solutions to uh, ensure that, you know, the building decor or the campus decorum still stays the same, the connections and so on and so forth. Well, it can connect to the existing build form. So this was an existing central part of the campus that was already there. There was a huge large basement that was there. There were many classes so on and so forth that, that they were doing it here. And they built this entire large form on top, saying that how do you connect from somebody at the level to somebody who you will take them slightly higher, the trees. And if that is a focal point, how do you connect them? And how is the built form for a user? This is part of it, part of the design, where again, since I'm giving you this case study because this will, uh, evoke very well to what you guys need to design for like classrooms. Then you have all the other areas like you know, toilets, uh, uh, the libraries, uh, collaboration areas, so on and so forth. These are the di different classroom lecture halls as what they call it, tiered lecture halls and air conditioned. Some of them are cooled only actually, not just conditioned. And how, uh, uh, an existing long central corridor, which was a corridor, connected with these 
uh, buildings which came in at a later stage. What is interesting is this is how it came out as. The basement was used as a base and the building was built completely uh, beyond. They, they made a, they put a, they, they had a lot of, uh, what can I say, glass blocks which seem suspended from the top. They had a very strong roof on top, which also brought in uh, some fantastic light on the, from the north and south with the clear story uh, uh, windows in. They had shading, they had very thick walls. So one of the choice materials was also, is also a stone in uh, IMB and that itself has fantastic thermal properties if you can have good enough thickness and you know, uh, it's not too tall. The buildings were great. And the fenestrations are deep, so it works fantastic. This is what it brought in. It looks like a series of stairs, but this is this was well done and it works very well even for uh, people with disabilities. Ramps are added in so that, you know, it's, it, it's interesting for people with wheelchairs or other walking disabilities to also take in and, and the staircase is not just the only part of the building which is good and gives good uh, experiences to the user. These are some of the images. I just need to drink some water. So the image on the left, you will see these uh, brilliantly placed glass blocks, actually mesh blocks here. Uh, this is, uh, in this situation, this is the staircase that we're talking about. Far end, on the farther end, we see the corridor, the part of the corridor over there. And this is standing in at the point over here. From here to there, that's it. <laughs> With all the, uh, uh, what can I say? The rooms, the lecture halls and all that on the sides, we have some, uh, yeah, this is a glass block that I was talking about. It juts out like randomly in the building, which is uh, their collaboration uh, where, people, where students can argue, form an opinion, discuss, uh, make healthy conversations, um, and collaborate on different of uh, their education uh, life, if my, my call, or, or, or a journey. And the aspect of Saving trees, the tree looks much better now. It's flowered, right? Uh, there are many more leaves. This was taken much, much earlier on, I guess. Part of the older part of the campus, newer part of the campus. Next case study that I would like to bring about is um, not an educational building, but this is a business building. It's called the Titan Integrity Campus. And this is a building which which breaks, you know, the monotony of uh, of straight long facades and uh, brings in a lot of interesting play with water bodies and various different levels of the topography. The campus has a lake uh, very close, uh, not so close as what is shown in the building because that would be illegal, but it's quite close to the campus. Uh, it's one of the lakes, uh, very fantastically maintained lake in uh, Bangalore. Of course, it got maintained much better after the camp, after the building came up. But and the out the exist the uh, architect introduced a large water body which relates to the lake outside. So, in a way of you know seamlessly trying to give these views for somebody who's inside to see that there's a water body here and then the water body outside as well. What's interesting is of the interiors of the building as the breeze comes in. Uh, what is also interesting is this water is not just kept for the heck of it. These water bodies also comprise uh, required uh, water for fire. There are uh, tanks underneath which cater to the water requirement of the building itself. Uh, this also part of the water body here is uh, good catchment area that is for rainwater harvesting works great and it is used uh, in various ways inside the building and there's much uh, greenery around it has a lot of terraces the terraces are green as well and all of this water is used uh, uh, partly uh, for uh, irrigation actually what is interesting is 
used, the wastewater used in the toilets are uh, recycled and used for irrigation. It's a small uh, video that shows how the whole thing came about. So that's the expanse of the building. That's the lake outside. And those are the different terraces. The entries, the main access roads, the movements. Run once more so that you guys get an idea how it is. So that's the fire sump as what I was talking about. That is actually underneath that. There's a whole series of water bodies which are connected, but it just looks like a large expanse uh, for our onlooker. Let's move on to the of the building. These are the different terraces. The terraces recede, they are green. Uh, they maintain extremely well. I will show you a few photos. Very interesting parts were these anthill type courtyards. Like one over here, like what the architect brought in, it brings in light from uh, uh, indirect light from uh, north and south. And of course, they look fantastic when for somebody who's sitting here or sitting at the lower level or standing at the lower level and looking up of a third or the fourth floor that is there. This is on the right is the uh, uh, section of the anthill type courtyard, what I was talking about. Uh, the interiors get lit up. There's a large swath of it. These are, again, a from boring, long, straight uh, facades that we have. This is a fantastic green uh, textured facade, if I may call so. And this is how. This is actually on a higher level. The terraces are fantastically used. The topography has been such that, uh, of course, much of the landform was sloping towards the natural lake that was there. But the architect chose to bring in certain levels in the building itself so that the natural gradation remains the same, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, none of the uh, runoffs or any um, uh, water or wastewater or grey water or from this building does not get fed into the river. So to the lake, sorry, it gets uh, uh, recycled within the campus. There is an STP, there's a very there's an excellent and they have uh, where the food gets, uh, you know, segregated, the food waste gets segregated, it goes into uh, the biogas plant that is there. The In turn, the biogas starts, uh, biogas actually uh, uh, mm, is fed back into the kitchens and the kitchens run on the wire. So that is one of the uh, examples of circular design and one of the examples how one can achieve net zero eventually. Moving on. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say about design. We should now ask for any questions. Anybody has any questions? That would be great to. Uh, uh, Preeti or uh, Sindhu, can you uh, unmute your uh, person and ask questions if there are any? Just a minute. I think I just need to stop sharing. And yeah, yeah. Get to see the people. Yes, that will be great. Yes. So before anybody asks questions, I hope it was not too boring. OK, I can see some slight smiles. That's good enough for me. Let's hear. Any questions from any of you guys? Can't hear. I think you have to unmute. Uh, I think it was an elaborate uh, the session what we had. You had started from the planning matrix uh, of looking at it. 
somewhere I was feeling jealous, like if at all this sort of a lecture has come when I was designing something like this, where uh, maybe at a student level, they may feel like a few points are going out of their head, but even if they get to that point, uh, it makes a lot of difference what we truly believe. And the case studies, what you had shown, the, how the building acts, all those things were wonderful. But I don't know how much percentage they get into them. So we would be uh, knowing that when they design. And you had touched upon almost all the points of the campus. So, and uh, frankly, like we are done with the uh, literature and desktop studies and case studies. We are to start with the concept. And this would be a great start for them because as a campus, they got a holistic picture of what has been, what has to be looked at, how uh, from an architect's point of view, from a services point of view, and how all these things collaborate to form a building. Like throughout your presentation, what you were uh, seeing as a building was, it was a living organism. It's breathes in and breathes out. So I think, yes, I think uh, a mic problem solved. Muktishwar? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Shaman. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I was asking the class there. Uh, or else, like individual students can ask from the uh, login uh, this thing from the system. Yeah, a a anything, anyway. Either yeah. way is good. If any one of you want to uh, want me to re, uh, you know, show any of the slides, if it was a little too heavy, I can do that also. That's fair enough. I think, uh, yeah, I got a message. Can you hear me now? Yeah, a lot of echo. I think all the students need to mute your mic. Yes, sir, I heard you. There is a minor yeah. issue with the mic. There is an issue with the mic, but just give me one minute. Yeah, yeah, please. I would like to also say that in case any of the students um, or any of the people, any any one of you, want to elaborate, want to deliberate, uh, welcome. Please write to me. This is my email ID, and uh, I would just request you to please put a subject. Okay, so if you want to organize this, what is what is it? With the subject hashtag campus design, so I'll know it's one of you guys who listen to a bit of what I said. I think so. Let's get. Let, let us get away from the mic and uh, let us individually connect uh, to our online uh, network. It is visible. Hi. You hear me? Yes, very much. Okay. Yeah, hi Sahana is very interesting uh, presentation and never boring for me, even for me, me and uh, Sham. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, before we ask some questions, our students have will interact with you. Okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. No, it's not. Quickly, make some talks. Make a note of me. All you guys are making my job much easier if you don't have any questions. <laughs> yeah, Riti, one minute. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. This is Preeti. Hey, Preeti. Uh, my question was like when you, uh, we, you were telling us about the efficient facade design, uh, one of the topic was sustainable site design. Like, how does the site design impact the facade, efficient facade design? Okay. Is that the end of your question? Huh? Is that the end of the, your question? 
yeah i mean yeah. like uh, how is the sustainable side design imp- give an impact to the uh, facade which is yeah. like the just the face of the building yeah so one of the uh, points to understand is that when you design a campus and this is to achieve net zero that was the point of that of the metrics that I, to achieve net zero a uh, building in its all, all of its parts is as important to the campus and everything in the campus is important to achieve um, uh, net zero now how well uh, yes in a way it is connected because if you do choose to condition a building from the inside okay the choice of condition non conditioning whatever however you want to uh, uh, design the inside that is connected to the facade this much you understood right the facade how you don't shade how much heat you let in how much heat you uh, how much you insulate how much you don't this decides on how you condition the building now in a building what are the things that's required electricity right that's energy now then there is uh, then to cool air you need water right so you have chillers or you have any other or geothermal cooling whatever it is but you need water to do a lot of this now that's again a form of energy that we are talking about. for water when you balance out so that comes up as the percentage of water building is going to take to remain uh in comfort mode okay so for this this much of amount of water with respect to the rest of the campus design when i talk about sustainable design, i mean to say the water run of water meaning the rain is a rain water in the rest of the site is that getting harvested somewhere okay now for the landscape there is a lot of water that runs off meaning that goes off is that getting Uh, saved somewhere or are we letting the water go into the drains if that water is getting saved then that is a okay that's sustainable in the site level at the building level if i'm my heating or my cooling loads that means i'm reducing the amount of water. that means it adds up to the overall water requirement or a consumption at the campus level so that will reach the net zero goals that's what it means i hope i i explained it yes ma'am thank you so we can't see you guys so but the camera might have uh, switched off or something like that yeah now we can see you one of the primary aspects of net zero design actually is that you start looking at the campus and its buildings and every part of it as a microorganism or as an organism so an organism lives like lives and breathes like what shaman just mentioned it's not it also shits it um, you know it it leaves out a lot of waste it also eats a lot of food so all of this has to be taken care of with respect to the entire campus only if you do a balance of the things that that it consumes versus what can be generated achieve some level of uh, uh, balance and some level of energy efficiency ma'am yeah um, what are the key factors or considerations that should be taken into account when we are designing the different campuses uh, buildings or facilities Yeah, I thought that was a, that was of the of today's full talk. <laughs> I was giving you, I am giving you. Now, I mean, your question just means I need to tell you, I need to give you the entire <laughs> all over again. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. Uh, key things would be I'll, I'll things that I mentioned. The key key things I'm going to also share my screen because seeing is, I'm guessing a lot more. easier to understand the first slide i think first slide yeah. yeah 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 these would be the base the one of the main things all of these the campus level campus design parametrics i mean to say at the master planning level at the site level 
and these would be at the building level. This would make I call these as metrics uh, for design. So that would be identify, identifying, locating, orienting the buildings, ensuring how you connect to the overall thing, areas of a building, which means that you know the shape and size of a building, uh, the facade design because of all the stuff that I just said. Then optimizing design, relooking at it, trying to can I make it smaller, can I make it larger, uh, and these compass encompasses all the aspects of design, which would be not just architecture design, landscape design, plumbing, electrical, electric, uh, electric design, uh, uh, heating and cooling, uh, and then a whole lot of other designs uh, in the campus. I hope this is okay. Or uh, I can just give you a one on one session again if you want. Yeah, Sindhu. Yeah, Sindhu. No, sir. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Is there are no more questions and we understood everything? Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, my name Hi. is Kirtana. So uh, basically, there is a lot of focus on the biophilic design these days where uh, we tend to get to connect with nature. So uh, coming to the design of the campus, how can we like have a connect to the outdoor and the uh, indoor spaces, uh, you know, when considering the design and everything? So Yes, good question. Very uh, interesting point, and you are uh, keeping up to date with what's happening in the industry. I see. Uh, biophilic. This talk about biophilic design in the industry level has been happening, and it's been more and more coming out uh, post COVID. Uh, if I may say so. Anyway, coming back to your question, biophilic design is uh, one of the aspects of design that one brings in. Now, uh, there are different ways to connect with nature. One of the simple ways that I can start with is I have a desk where I come to work or I sit and uh, uh, study at a library is to keep a plant. I'm connected to it. That's a biophilia already because a plant is my way of connecting to nature. Larger aspects, zoom out a little more. And if in the corridors, for example, as I move through from one building to another or from one lecture hall to another. If I have smaller areas of say pots or say if I have areas where trees can grow, the user during the movement, um, you know, this during connection phase from one uh, uh, activity to another can see or can relate to plants and uh, to nature. That's another way to do it. Zoom out a little more. Between two blocks, if there are small pockets of nature, when I say nature, nature is a very large uh, and an umbrella uh, word. What I mean to say is plants and uh, uh, grass and uh, uh, so if it's possible. Uh, if I can relate to it, if I can see it, and if it is visible during when I'm walking from one building, one lecture hall to another, from uh, walking from one of the uh, SOTs to uh, the cafeteria. If I can see it, well, that's a part of biophilic design. It's there, you can relate to it. How much you uh, can introduce nature in the, uh, in the building is up to the, of course, these are some ways of doing it. Now, in one of the case studies, uh, would you that was yeah okay we talk about IMB in this the connection that this, that this corridor or this staircase allows for the campus at the last which is it's a very green campus actually there's a lot of trees uh, not just manly uh, meaning not just uh, 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 I can't call it as man-made trees I mean it's not landscaped actually quite a lot of uh, the wooded area which is there, which you can see beyond. Now, this is a form of biophilia. Here, of course, 
once a tree lives and once a tree is alive, uh, there are a lot of plants here and uh, there is sunlight coming in so the plants can thrive. So this mixture of, you know, what the entire idea of nature brings in with light and shadow, not just a green, is it, is it also having a small aspect of light falling in? That means that as throughout the day, there's a little bit of shadow of the leaves coming in. If there's a little bit of breeze comes in, then the leaves move. These are the aspects of nature that all of us like. That can be possible within a built environment, then that's biophilia. One of the other ways in the, this one was this. In this building, there are these fantastic uh, terraces which the architect has brought out. They are terraces which keep receding and goes up to the tallmost, to the tall, to the topmost level. And there are trees. I mean, these are actually mantle trees which will grow eventually quite dense and they're fantastic like a umbrella, you know, these trees are. Uh, 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 and there is uh, buffalo grass. I mean, there's grass where people uh, can sit out and uh, uh, and uh, can see from inside the building. You can relate to this. Yes, these are all aspects of biophilia. Thank you, Right. Yep. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Next, Shihita. You made some question. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi. Uh, so my question is: there are there are times when um, I'm Tejaswini. Uh, I think so. My my question is, there are times when because of the budget constraints, we cannot accommodate all the net zero requirements. So are there any uh, alternative uh, alternative measurements that we can take to uh, get the equal benefits to any kind of design that we make? Valid question, but it's, 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 um, it's a mix of things. They just need the thing is, uh, see every design has constraints, right? Every designer yes. will have constraints. Uh, one of the prime factors of being a client is actually to come up with a lot of constraints so that the consultant can come up with solutions that can encompass or can, can go beyond these constraints. Yes. Many times these constraints are fantastic uh, opportunities to design, to make our design much better. Constraints are not always to be looked at as a negative aspect, I have never seen constraints to be uh, constraints like budget, for example, constraints like budget or or uh, or a site uh, uh, layout that way it is, or a neighborhood or um, exit and entries. None of these constraints are really uh, negative aspects, but actually positive aspects of design, which will shape your design to be that much more effective. Now, budget. Uh, is a very, again, an umbrella word, how much a client would like to spend on a particular campus or a particular building. Uh, there is always an, we call it an industry, which where you make a complete costing of, of a building, saying that it costs an X amount, like it costs 100 crores for a building, uh, for a campus like this kind of a design. So as consultants, we are, uh, what can I say? We have to give A, B, C, D options and various aspects of design to achieve certain things in the given budget. Okay. The industry has multiple materials. The industry has many more technologies. It is instrumental right now at this stage and at this time when all of you guys will be getting into the industry to use technology to the extent that it can be much more useful. There are technologies right now in the industry which makes a cooling more efficient. If you design certain, uh, certain areas to, to have lights on only at certain period of time, meaning only when somebody uh, uses a room, the lights are going to be on, for example. Otherwise, the lights switch off by themselves. Now, these are sensors that, that, are, that will make this work, right? By sensors in creative ways, you can actually reduce electricity consumption up to 30% as compared to don't use sensors, right? 
So there are many such uh, situations that are there, such, such technologies that are there, materials that are there. There are subject matter experts who are doing this work in the industry, in the construction industry, who uh, will give certain solutions. And as a designer, as an architect, as a mechanical uh, designer, as an electrical designer, all of you, all of us can design something that can make it much better. We can definitely achieve uh, very good results in good budget, okay? Budget is not always a constraint. And it is a myth that uh, energy efficient buildings cost more money. No, they don't. There is a very slight marginal difference between what uh, uh, how much it costs to build an energy efficient building. However, the budget comes into a picture, not just the construction of the building, budget comes through the entire life cycle of building or a campus. So that means that for it to be in operation, a non-efficient building, do the metrics, an efficient building with XYZ technologies, do the metrics, do, do the document. You can see yourself what works better. And in the industry, that is the way to go, almost always done, to see which works better. Budget is almost never, uh, what can I say, a constraint that way. Because passive design technologies, like what we saw now, like what I did show you about the shading of the facade, the ensuring that you, know, you, you don't, uh, you keep all your utilities in one place so that your, uh, your movement of, certain building, certain kind of, uh, uh, what do you say, um, for maintenance and all that becomes much reduced. All of this adds up into a lot of uh, savings in the life cycle of the project. So always look at it from the life cycle aspect and not just to construct. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Yes, Sahana, if you have time, there are two more questions. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Aditi. Hi, Aditi. Uh, ma'am, my question to you is how do you approach the design of communal spaces and uh, common spaces, outdoor spaces, so that it, it is effective at the same time and aesthetically pleasing? Okay. Effective, I can say. Aesthetically pleasing is something which is um, very, very relative, meaning Effective. beauty is an art of the beast. So... <laughs> Whether it's aesthetic or not, well, as a designer, you can decide, as a client, I can decide. But I will tell you, how do you design communal spaces? And what is the other one, sorry? And outdoor spaces. Oh, okay, I, I would call them both pretty much the same. Okay, or I would like to call the outdoor spaces as uh, uh, green areas. Yeah, large uh, green areas that we're talking about. So, Communal areas. Now, now let's bring this in. When you design, uh, okay, sorry, I'm going to go back to this part. You see this part where I'm talking about connect, using that as a metric. When you talk about, when you make a, uh, when you follow these different, different, different aspects of design, when you say, okay, now how am I connecting? You place your buildings and then you make sure that one person moves from one thing to another and how does one move it? move from one thing to another. You already have places which are there. If A, if you have a direct connect to say this building, yeah, there's a straight direct road, right? This is one example. Next, can I take a meandering path? Perhaps, yes. If I can actually move out, go around the uh, central, uh, so go over there and then get into this path. Now I have a longer road I will also go into a large part of the green area that is there designed over here. Plus, I also have an opportunity that there is a small area in the center where there are no vehicles, people will move. There is a opportunity for a chance encounter with a fellow colleague, with a teacher, with a crush, with somebody whom you want to speak to. You can do that, decide about what you want to do later on and then move on. So these things, so you introduce these areas either deliberately like what i'm talking about here like we introduce paths so in the middle i can actually have some of these areas which help in uh, in you know these kind of 
uh, exchanges within people or you place these areas beforehand and then you say now I, I have area one area two i want somebody to get out of this building go through this area only while getting out of the campus you know these are the different you can talk about i hope that made some sense yes ma'am that thank you ma'am that was very helpful okay Any other question? Hello. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Myself, Nimtesh Chaturvedi. Hi, so hi. My question is, uh, how do you approach the balance between the aesthetics and the practicality of a design? Like if we take an example of a campus, so how do you manage that? Actually, it is a similar question to that. How do you manage aesthetics? And the aesthetics and the practicality, like functioning of the uh, area, the design. Okay. First of all, aesthetics and practical aspect are not two different things. Okay. Uh, and they're also not things which are opposites. They're not. They are just different aspects of design that you need to go through and satisfy all of them. If you see the metrics that I'm talking about here, the location, the orientation, the connect, and the area, these are all practical aspects of it, right? Yes, I'm talking about facade design, which brings in the idea of how the building looks versus, and sorry, how the building okay. looks versus, sorry, how the building looks and how it performs. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So one of the very simple answer that I can give you is use technology. Use a lot of uh, new materials that are there. To bring it so that it allows you to achieve a certain level of aesthetics in your buildings as well as achieve good performance having said that i don't mean to say that materials like uh, bamboo and uh, 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 what else uh, not going to give no they do every material that you can think of can give you very good performance if you do a little bit of adjustments to it meaning design them into detail Okay, I'll give you a small example. Um, okay, I, I don't know how many of you over here like glass buildings. So there is a glass building. And you want to uh, uh, portray that as, as a great looking, take care of the aesthetics. I will bring in a lot of uh, movement in the facade. I will bring in some nice elements so it looks good, bring in color, bring in texture, all of that. But still it is glass. How do we make that more efficient? A we introduce insulation in the glass, okay? The glass, the fenestration thing about, we, we make a decision, how much, where did that go? I wanted to show you something on the matrix. Yeah, this. So how much of the facade do you want to open to make it look good? This is your aesthetic decision. This is a decision which will make your building from A looking good to looking so-so. There is no bad building. Okay. They are so-so buildings, they are good buildings. Look, they're, they're, these buildings can also be made to perform well by using certain other aspects. Now, if you want a complete 100% facade building, wherein a, the facade is in, okay, you introduce certain, um, I don't know, vertical elements, certain horizontal elements so that it breaks the monotony of a large, long facade. Now, we already introduced certain things like a horizontal or a vertical. Now, these things, can they share the glass, the glass that we're talking about? Great. You're already adding one layer of performance to it. The choice of glass, double glazed, triple glazed versus single thin glass. You, it's already, you're already introducing an aspect of performance to it. Uh, Glass that can be broken down into different aspects, meaning different types of glass in the same facade. Have one glass where light comes in, meaning the visual light transmission is much more, meaning much more light comes in. The top and the bottom of part of the panes of glass need not have so much of light coming in, but you introduce insulation over there. These are called spandrel. 
that there there you have it you are a lot of performance that is being uh, added in to the skin of the building not compromising on how the building looks from the outside or from the inside so these are some examples you can also introduce so you can also say that no i do not want uh, light i just want to go ahead with like say 30% or 50% of a fenestration uh, facade but what do you do with the rest of it you have you can build a regular uh, block work wall or you can build a or you can have these precast panels over there but bring in insulation behind it so that facade or the skin that you're talking about is already having a good performance okay that is one of it another very important part is the roof of the building how are we dealing with the roof of the building do we just have a plain flat roof well we can't uh, effectively because water is going to go on it so you'll have to line it in a particular slope do we have a complete slope building we can do various things right so there are many things that you can uh, make plus detail it out with certain materials and certain technologies that are there in the industry to make them more efficient I hope I answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Each question is simple. He wants to use. I think he's asking about form versus function. He was form he, versus function. Yeah, he was referring to the aesthetics. Means we generally take the form and then talk about the function. So how we generally manage? That's what he is asking. But I think the answer is yeah. Okay. So this is a this is a very classic question, isn't it? I'm sure you guys must have asked this question to yes. hundreds of your teachers or your uh, uh, peers. Um, and this has also been a question that I'm sure Shamant asked during his college time. I asked during my college time, and uh, maybe even uh, Miss Vibhuti asked during her college time. The point is, and and now I also have another opinion on the same thing. They might. there might have been multiple opinions in what i'm going to say is my opinion on the idea of form versus function first of all there are two versus okay form and function are of the same part of a solution that you are giving they can't be two a warring okay if as a designer you're bringing in form and you're bringing in function and you're saying that these things don't match then it's it's a disaster you haven't designed anything over there what are you doing there really as a designer if you can amalgamate them both as achieve some great looking buildings as well as good performance buildings then you've done some work as a designer otherwise you've not done anything over <laughs> that was a little harsh but i hope that answered your question yes ma'am yes, ma thank you ma'am i think uh, our director uh, is here uh, it's uh, sunil kumar architect sunil kumar sir you want to add some point sahan uh, director sir is here thank you sahan and thank you for this program good evening and the questions uh, itself uh, uh, it, uh, makes it uh, uh, what to say right that they are asking you right questions right and relevant questions so, yeah especially when we are talking about uh, this is net zero or net positive and then when we are talking about uh, aesthetics in campus right and the capital costs of uh, doing these buildings right so when we are designing campuses i think all these uh, uh, border lines will vanish they, they should not be any challenges about uh, capitals capital costs or there are no challenges about aesthetics or the form function because campus is going to stay there for i say next 100 150 years and, uh, so if it is in the context of uh, at that point of time that we are designing the campus so it should be showcase the best that is available at that point of time any campus should reflect the best right maybe yeah. the design or the 
uh, knowledge or the material, the technologies, right? Because the, the smiles work in that place, right? Yeah. So they should understand that uh, designing a campus node, there are no limits. It, it's a privilege for students. You see where designing a campus is, they don't have such constraints of uh, of budget. Uh, then I was a little surprised when somebody came up and said, oh, what about budget? Uh, yeah. Yes, you you guys at, at your level at the college, you're privileged. I mean, you don't need to bother about certain things. Yes. But uh, it is good to be mindful about why a campus is even being designed for. Uh, I think that's where the context comes in. Um, uh, yeah, comes in, I mean, uh, if you want to connect, uh, and it's not really something that that we would want to talk to you about at this stage. Aesthetics is something that you all have already honed, you know, your own way, your own language, your own um, uh, design um, uh, capabilities that that has been honed by by the by the faculty. I mean, all of you guys have done a lot of work, I'm sure, to help all the students hone a uh, sense. Themselves and to express in a particular way. But there are much more than just aesthetics when uh, you design something as an architect. And I think today, that was what I was trying to say. Campus is the uh, best design challenge any architect uh, dreams, right? <laughs> Doing a campus <laughs> is one of the uh, dream projects of any campus because- True, uh, but coming in- is the best. Yeah, true, true. But coming in from the client side or coming in from the, what can I say, from the management side, why would the management want to actually have, um, have say, uh, so many students coming and uh, uh, why would they want to invest in, uh, A, of course, it is a business decision to do it. It is very good to be aware of that fact, uh, even as a student when one is designing it. The thing is, uh, what is it that as, how can your design ensure that collaboration can come in? How can you make the college a destination? How can you ensure that students don't drop out of colleges? You know, yeah, a college, uh, how, how can you ensure that a student feels more belonged to that particular college or a campus so that they feel good about coming back and remember and be a part of an alumni at a later stage? Very important in, in design and that's where architecture design uh, makes a big and uh, successfully, you know, all the architects should be doing biophilic. Like, biophilic is not a new thing to do, or uh, it is not a new design parameter. It, it has to come naturally to any architect that he should connect nature and uh, the people, uh, whatever big scale that they are creating. So, uh, the marketing strategy of uh, a biophilic design, you know, it is a marketing strategy. So, you should not get carried away by your strategy. Us, but definitely, any sensible architect will relate his built environment to the nature because uh, that is where uh, humans uh, have uh, evolved through nature, through any built scales that we are creating to complement to uh, the nature. And uh, the architect will be doing that, and if they need uh, some parameters to say this is the biophilic architecture, you know, they should uh, uh, understand, okay, these are the parameters, that's all, that not... Uh, and not make that as the main, yeah, yes. not, not, yeah. yeah. And uh, definitely technology is one uh, great platform, which uh, every architect should understand uh, with respect to uh, lighting, ventilation, Whatever it is, natural ventilation, passive, passive uh, efforts, right? So uh, that is where uh, the understanding has to be more so that you know, when they design the campus, right, they are uh, doing it naturally and more uh, what they say, uh, that, that should be the most uh, aim. Uh, then they will be able to definitely do it. And the aesthetics in a campus, it it is the fifth dimension. Time gives those aesthetics to your campus, isn't it? So the yeah. is that you make uh, actually add this to the value of aesthetics of the building. So no one is worried about how that building is looking. Everyone yeah. is why would why would anybody want to go to a building which does why do why would anyone want to go to a campus which doesn't look good? Why yes. would I do that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, as a designer, I mean that's your basic job. 
make it look good. I mean, you have to do that first. All the time, the campus buildings are definitely of good proportion and size. So everyone will uh, be able to actually create a sense of specific language in, way, in any campus. Okay. How to design a bad building in a campus. Right. Thank you. And it was so nice, uh, your presentation. And the way you have guided the uh, audience architects. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Dean, uh, Ms. Vibhuti Sachdev, uh, you, Mr. Sunil Kumar, the faculty, Shamant, of course, Tapu uh, Teshwar, all of you guys for this opportunity. It has been great. I would uh, uh, be very open to uh, answer any of your questions if some of these concepts were a little, um, I don't know, hard to understand, or uh, if any one of you want to revisit it, you can. Please. The email ID that I have written that I showed you, uh, but please mention that in the uh, with the hashtag campus design so that I'll know that any one of you guys, uh, you know, have uh, at least seen the presentation and then ask me those questions. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Sahana. I know I have taken your major chunk of your time <laughs> with, okay. to work more. But thank you very much for your contribution. I think Tapati. Uh, I usually whenever a guest lecture comes, right, we have. We take a group photo. Uh, let me make a screenshot. If I think somebody will have to do a Photoshop of my <laughs> myself in it. Is Tapati there? Uh, can this sir? Tapati ma'am is there? Yeah, yeah. Let's ask her to come where you're standing. We can click a picture. Yeah. Sure. So thank um, you very much uh, for giving your time and it was really uh, really a great session for us to start uh, with this session enter into the concept i i think this was a greater start for us to do nothing much we would have asked about yeah uh, can we aditi will you do that a screenshot one yeah or else i'll do it yeah all of you face down your camera yeah Just hold, just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah. yeah I think I clicked the picture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sahana. We wish we could see you in future too for uh, our reviews. Yeah. But I would be open to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank sir. you, uh, Shah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for your time and patiently answering all your students' questions. Yes, sure. Anytime. Okay. Thank you. Now we officially end the session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, Arvind sir, are you here? Adit, Diru. I am here, Shaman Krish. Thank you, Arvind sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you for giving, uh, sharing the knowledge and. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, thank you madam